graduate students, he was introduced to the nascent field of nutrition informatics. Nutrition informatics holds great potential to improve health outcomes, both in personalized medicine and <coughs> population health. The nutrition data mining lab has developed two methods for estimating the quality of food purchased at grocery stores. One is tagged to the USDA food plan and hopes to use it to steer households to a healthier home food environment. And the other is pegged to the NCI USDA healthy eating index and can be used to assess food quality at the household or the public health level. And thank you, John, so much for presenting. Happy to be here. Is this uh, loud enough? Am I? I've got a bit of a cold, so if I begin to wane out of out of volume, somebody raise their hand. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Uh, you know, Jennifer is right. I fr I got dragged kicking and screaming into this field of nutrition informatics. I had a graduate student. I'll tell you about her work in just a few minutes. Who got interested in this uh, as part of the work on the National Children's Study, and I was trying to keep her at bay with one arm because <laughs> I had other things to do, and then. Phil came along, and I was another arm, and then Wally came along, I didn't have enough arms, I couldn't keep everybody away, so, so I might as well just learn something about nutrition. Uh, so I'm happy to say that uh, we've made a lot of progress, and this really is an update of where we are. Uh, our team, um, myself, Phil, and Wally, and Tui, uh, work here in the Department of Biomedical Informatics. Patricia Gunther and Chris Jordan, who's here this morning, thanks for coming, Chris. Uh, in the new Department of Nutrition and Integrative Physiology at the university. Uh, because we have some behavioral economics and behavioral change theory to, to grapple with, Debbie Scammon, it's the marketing uh, department in the School of Business is with us. And we just recently formed a partnership with university, uh, Utah State University. Carrie Durward is a colleague, you'll see what, what we're doing with her shortly. And she's supported by her two colleagues, Heidi and Paul. So diet related morbidity, <laughs> morbidity, morbidity, morbidity and mortality. Really, do I need to stress this to this audience that there is a problem <laughs> if we have poor diets, we have poor health. I mean, could spend the rest of the hour talking about nothing but this. But I'm going to do one, one picture. I think it's really salient. <clears throat> this is a map of the prevalence of diabetes in the US. 1994 and 2012, what's interesting, so the, the darker it gets, the higher the prevalence. So in 1994, there was only one state that had over 7% prevalence. Less than 20 years later, there was not a single state that had less. Had, so every single state had at least seven, and many, particularly in the South, uh, and this map almost maps directly to the equivalent maps of obesity incidents in the country. So we flipped completely around when it comes to diabetes and obesity. And as you probably know, those two things together cost hundreds of millions of dollars every year and um, it's just one of many diet-related maladies. So I'm not gonna spend any more time justifying why we do what we do. We think it's important long-term work. And rather than build up to the big climax and show you this at the very end, I'm going to show you the end first. This is where we'd like to go. So we um, can imagine uh, from the perspective of a wellness plan or a healthcare plan or a hospital who has patients, uh, clients of any kind, they're shopping. We partner with Kroger, so I use Smith's here. Smith's takes all those little shopping snippets when you, when you check out and they store them in a database for about 18 months. What we have built are a set of tools that can use that data, we call this thing Qualmart, uh, and then make, in the long term, our goal is to make recommendations, and that could be anything from text to coupons to menus to emails to apps. Um, you can imagine that my 20-year-old daughter would probably want an app. My 65-year-old sister probably would want a menu. We, we don't know how to best deliver these recommendations, but we're pretty sure we can measure food quality and make the recommendations. The rest of this picture, though, is kind of cool because we can measure over time how compliant, as people keep shopping, they are with these recommendations. We can feed that information back to whoever might be interested in. So someone like the health plan might be interested. They might be willing to provide incentives to help these families stay in a healthier food environment state. 
Uh, likewise, clinicians might be interested to track over time how their, how their patient's household food environment is changing. And that, I think, could empower shared decision making, which is all the rage now in clinical medicine. So that's where we want to end up. Someday I want to do this trial where we actually recruit families, measure their quality, make recommendations, see if we can detect any changes in health-related outcomes. So that's where we're going, I hope. But how are we going to get there? Well, it's interesting. The Food Marketing Institute, this is the largest retail grocery association in the country. Over 40,000 retailers belong to it. They have a glossy magazine, as every big um, association does. And in 2013, they, they had this all over the cover of, of an issue. Cost and lack of motivation are the major barriers to healthy eating. Let's unpack that just a, a little bit. Cost may be a factor, although the USDA Economic Research Service has published a bunch of papers on why that might not be the case. They're convinced Americans can eat well, healthily, on a budget. Um, and lack of motivation comes in part because we're deniers. This particular graphic, again, from that glossy from the food marketing, shows that only 10% of shoppers with kids 6 to 18 think any of their kids are overweight, when in fact we know a third of all kids in that age range in this country are overweight or obese. So um, we need to find a way to uh, help people uh, move beyond denying and to find the motivation that they need. Uh, and they're spot on here, healthy eating, health, what's healthy and what's not, that is becoming clearer. And that's exactly where our Qualmart technology is meant to target. So what is it that we actually do? Well, we don't measure dietary intake. That's the, that's the goal. We'd love to do that. That would be ideal. If everything all of you ate all day long for the next 10 years, if I could somehow record that, that uh, would be incredibly useful. But it's really, really hard to do that. So what we do model is something more tractable, which is the quality of the home food environment. What we don't do is we don't focus on individuals because, again, getting data on individuals, dietary intake is really, really difficult. So we focus on households. But it's estimated, it depends on which journal article you read, and this all comes from studies on a large data set called NHANES, the National uh, Nutrition and Health Examination Survey run by the CDC every two years. Um, a lot of our calories come from re retail grocery. So we're settling for just 60 to 70% of the picture. We would rather do that really well than try to do a really bad job at 100%. Uh, we don't pick ad hoc or uh, black box nutrition standards. We go right to the source, the USDA, and the good science there um, is what we build our, all of our work on. This is the state of the art in the 21st century of tracking diet. That's a diet that's a dietary re recall where someone's listed at 7.15, I had one cup of skim milk, 3 p.m., one cup of tea, now, you could, you could imagine that individuals could do this for a day or two or even a week. But we're interested in long-term study, so how are you going to do that? It's just, and then someone has to translate this into quantities of hundreds of grams, and then, and then they can calculate some kind of measure. Uh, so the second best thing is to have them do fill it up. It's called the Food Frequency Questionnaire. This is an actual questionnaire. By the time we got to this page, we're on question 64. Over the past 12 months, here's my favorite, how often did you eat beef or steak on a sandwich? And there are 10 different choices down here. So uh, it's very cognitively demanding. <laughs> it goes on, it keeps going on. I can't tell you what I ate last Friday for lunch, so let alone whether there was any beef in it. But this is what we ask people to fill out so we can, we can, get, we can get something, information about their diet. Uh, I'd like to point out that, in my opinion, the, the science of nutrition very much is built on the art of approximation. So in all these different tools, we're approximating some aspect of diet. Uh, why do you think things like this are, are not ideal? I mean, except for the fact it's really burdensome. If I'm going to ask Karen what she ate yesterday, do you think she would... But they, what, what's wrong with that? How could there be a problem? She's a very smart lady. You could lie. <laughs> you could forget about that tootsie, tootsie roll you snuck in. Uh, or you could just forget, right? And you might... 
Yeah, well, the quantities, they, they're here. Yeah, yeah, so it's like one glass, one cup, one and a half teaspoons of white sugar. Maybe it was really one tablespoon of white sugar. I mean, they're, they're just inherently biased, right? Um, and everyone in the nutrition field acknowledges this. We're looking for, for better ways. And so we're coming at this from a different angle. But even the, um, and I have to say that the 24-hour recall is considered by almost everybody as the best we can do. Now, there's a better way to do it than this. The NCI, the National Center, National Cancer Institute, rather, has developed something called the a ASA 24. It, it sort of walks you through picking foods. It's kind of hard to see, but cereals and energy bars, breakfast bars. If you click on breakfast bars, you get a whole bunch of specific breakfast bars. And if that's the one you ate, you click there and it gets added over there. And by the time you work through this whole thing, you've listed all the foods you had in the last 24 hours, and it can do the calculation. It knows how many grams that particular uh, breakfast bar weighed, and it'll figure out the, ca the calories and whatnot and come up with something called the healthy eating index which I will talk more about in just a second. So and it's online, um, it's free for use by consumers or by researchers, and uh, we're doing something really exciting with this in one of the studies I'm gonna talk about in just a few minutes. But the, uh, this, this is the best we can do, and it's electronic, at least it gets away from having to record all this stuff. So it's a movement in the right direction, and that was piloted by Amy Subar, who also, it turns out, is a world-class triathloner. I just learned that. So we do have a conceptual framework for our work. Um, this is a model of uh, healthy nutrition environments conceptual model. We're putting ourselves here, the consuming nutrition environment, uh, the organizational nutrition environment, home and work in particular, and in the community nutrition environment, um, working with stores. We don't deal with accessibility per se, but we do look at stores and uh, the role that, that they play in retail shopping. So just so you know, we do have a model. <laughs> We're not making all this up. And I'd like to thank Phil Brewster for um, convincing us to ground our work in this particular conceptual space. So our very first attempt, as I said, this started back in the late 2000s. Uh, Chris Brinkerhoff um, got her PhD in 2012. She uh, convinced Smiths uh, t and she convinced Primary Children's Hospital to work with Smith to encourage shoppers to sign up for a study. Um, and what, the, what the families had to do was that they had to let Chris and her assistant into their house. They had to fill out a, one of those clanky food frequency questionnaires. Uh, they scanned with a barcode scanner everything that they could scan, every food, and then went through the fridge and did the same thing. Um, so she had this FFQ and a household inventory and then all the shopping data, and she was just curious, how well did the shopping data correlate with these two things? Which, again, is, is pretty much a standard approach for a lot of nutritional epidemiology. Well, she had to hand map a whole bunch of UPCs over to a particular USDA database. It turned out she probably picked the wrong one, but, but this was a good start. And she couldn't map, but about 70% of them over, so she, but she could map 100% at the level of food groups. And that allowed her to produce charts like this. And for the longest time, we could not figure out how to analyze these data. We struggled and struggled and struggled. Chris did a great job. There's a number of, of graphs like this. This is, shows um, over the 50 weeks of shopping how well the, um, the, 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 what the correlation was between the sales data, just in terms of volume, and, the, and what was reported on the FFQ. And she's got a similar thing for the inventory. It was all over the map. I mean, there's some correlation across the year for fruits, but sugars and sweets actually go into a negative correlation down here. We, uh, we just don't, we just couldn't, we, we could never wrap our heads. We had several biostatisticians look at this. So it wasn't until um, Phil and Tui joined our team that we found new and better ways to analyze this. And I have to give credit to Ed Clark. He's the head of pediatrics here. He, uh, he used to be an N. Haynes interviewer. He'd sit down with families and walk them through those one and two day dietary recalls and he just bugged the heck out of them. So when he started his version of the National Children's Center study here, he asked Chris if she could come up with a better way and that's what got this whole thing started. So hats off to Ed for getting us to even think about this problem. So what are we gonna do? We have this, you know, we have 50 houses worth of data and we don't know how to analyze it. So being good informaticists, we decided we need to get more data. It can only help. 
So let me tell you something about our grocery model data set that we've been using in our work. Um, it comes from about 144,000 households shopping at Kroger stores over a 15-month period in four regions that Kroger operates in. So in particular, Seattle and its regions, this big thing around Salt Lake City, uh, this is the Smiths clan, um, Kroger stores in Atlanta, and then in, in what, um, Richmond, Virginia, that wasn't our first choice. It turns out Kroger doesn't have any presence up here. So we wanted to get a big Northeast urban or uh, Mid-Eastern urban center. We just, they just didn't have it. So we, we settled for these four. And this data is really skewed. So if you just take all the items that, are, that were sold, over uh, 170 million items that were transacted, about 90 to 100,000 individual UPCs, it's really skewed, right? So people buy one-offs all the time. And most of, the, uh, most of what happens, uh, what most of the shopping gets done is in the first couple thousand of the items in this large database of UPCs. It's just, just kind of interesting. Oh, I was going to ask you to figure this out, but <laughs> I showed it too soon. So this is, these are the top 10 across the country. Bananas, almost twice as large in volume as the next second one, which is avocados, which just surprises the heck out of me. So that strawberries is number three, I find really interesting. There's nothing really terribly unhealthy in here. So <laughs> as a nation, we're buying the right kinds of, right kinds of food. This, these are green peppers, corn yellow, uh, individual corn. But this gives you an idea of how difficult this data is. This is the only descriptor that we get from Kroger about what these items are. Can anybody guess what that is, except for volume? No? No? It's 2% low-fat milk in a plastic bottle. And this is the kind of thing that drives <laughs> Tui and Volley crazy, because we, we, we need to know what these things are. And that's the, that's the, it's literally the best we can get from Kroger. So, so Volley has come up with a way to get a, be, a better, longer, more complete descriptor. And um, you'll see how she uses that in just a second. So what we did with that data was to come up with two models. So we start with all this grocery data we got from Kroger. We, we do a lot of mapping. I'm not going to spend any time really describing the mapping in detail, but j just know that, that we were able to map uh, these food UPCs to some USDA databases that made sense. And if you're curious at the end, I'll go into it in more detail. But then once we have that mapping, we can, we can see how many of these foods map into the 29 food categories of something called the USDA food plans. And one of the, one of the versions of the food plans <laughs> is uh, built on expenditures. So the USDA says if you spend 5% of your grocery budget on bananas or whole fruit, that's, that's where you should be. Right, so we have the expenditure data. So Phil has built a model which can use the actual expenditures versus what people should be spending and figure out where the gaps are. What Tui did, she decided, decided to try to model the healthy eating index. It's like any sort of classic machine learning problem. She had all these, she knew she started with, the, with NHANES data, which is this big national survey. She, she took four or five cycles of that data, over 20,000 individuals reporting. And from that, she built this really cool um, model estimator whose math to this day I do not understand. But Tui comes from us, to, from the computer science department, where she's, she, she builds uh, complex models uh, in, her, in her sleep. So she <laughs> did a really good job. Things to remember, there are 29 different food categories. I'll show you some of those in just a second. In the food plans, there are four different food plans. One for people who spend a lot of money on food, a little bit of money on food, not so much money on food, and who are on essentially low-income budget, the kind of people who would be using food stamps, the SNAP program, for example. And then our goal, of course, is to use that information plus the household preferences as expressed expressed by their past shopping habits, and in future work, make recommendations to uh, improve quality and s see if that actually has an effect on, on the health. So here's the uh, food plan in particular. So we, we do the same thing. So here's some example food plan categories. Uh, whole gr uh, grains, breads, grains, rice and pasta, fruits, citrus, melons, meats, pork, et cetera. So we can map UPCs into those, and then Phil's tool can can use the data in the food plans uh, and the expenditures from the sales data to figure out 
gaps in the food. This particular example, this person was eating way too much refined grain and not nearly enough whole grain. So, so you, can, you, you, have, you know where the gaps are, right? You know what they like to buy. Uh, so you have a handle on how to, get to nudge them in an informative way into better buying habits. And uh, we haven't actually done this yet, but we, we think because the USDA argues so strongly that this can be budget neutral, we are considering building a linear programming model that would make these recommendations in such a way as to be budget neutral. That's an experiment we have not done yet. And this was all the brainchild of Phil. Now the healthy eating index, which I mentioned a couple of times, it's the uh, thing that comes out of the ASA 24, for example, is one of the most widely used metrics in nutrition. It has a really nice feature. It can, it's scaled, because of the way it's designed, you can use it on an individual, on a household, on a store, on a county. One team actually used it to, to rank the healthfulness of Taco Bell's menu. You can imagine how well that turned out. <laughs> uh, and one uh, set of researchers used it to estimate the quality of the entire U.S. food supply. Right, so it it's, can work at all those different scales, so it's very handy. These are the, t these are, are the components of the, uh, the 2010 version, um, total vegetables, greens and beans, total fruit, you can see them all there. Each one is scored, and uh, the people who came up with this, in, uh, we work with Patricia Gunther, who's sort of the godmother of the Healthy Eating Index. They decided, based on the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, 2010, uh, that, you know, sort of um, figure out how, how much to weight the value of each of these foods. So you can see the total vegetables can go from like terrible zero to max of five, but dairy is important, so it can go to max of 10. Whole grains are important, it goes to max of 10. That's because of the guidance built right into the dietary guidelines for Americans 2010. And then eating bad foods, this is, what, this is an inverse score. So these are solid fats, added sugar, um, and alcohol. Uh, and it's an inverted scale, so the higher it is, the less of this stuff you're eating. And then you add up all those scores and you get a number, which is very handy because it's a number. Uh, so what Tui did was she figured out how to model, using the NHANES data we had, uh, how to model the HEI from all these, because with, with the NHANES you, you get the HEI scores for, or can calculate them for the NHANES respondents, and built a very cool model. Here's an example of how it's used. So this is the, a shopper, um, the Avenues Smiths. The Avenues is a uh, sort of middle to upper middle class neighborhood. Uh, the greener a score is, the, the better, more healthy, the closer to this number they are. The grayer it is, they're kind of in the middle, and if it's pink or red, they're getting close to the zero end of these scales here. So this family is doing pretty good. They could use a little help with their total fruit, their whole fruit. Um, uh, but compare that to a shopper who spends the same amount of money. Both of these households spend over $200 a month on food. In, uh, in Moab, which is, as you know, a seasonal tourist town, for all kinds of reasons, you could expect that shoppers, they might be just there for a weekend or buying junk food, quite a bit different, right? Total vegetables, poor score, total fruit, whole fruit, whole grains, dairy, really low scores. Right, so this gives you some face validity that, that the metrics are, are, are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, we validated this model against NHANES. There is no good way to validate this against actual household shopping because there is no other way <laughs> that we know of to measure um, something like the HEI for a household. We think we've done it, but we can't, we can only do these sort of face validity checks. So I'll show you another one that's really cute in just a second. But we don't have a reference standard. NHANES is great, but it's one, it's thousands of people with just one day of eating for those thousands of people. We do really good with that, with a couple of exceptions, which we're fixing. But, and we think we're doing good up here, but we can't actually validate at the shopper level, at least not yet. Credit goes to TUI for this excellent model. A little bit about our data. We have over 100,000 UPCs and those little PLU codes you see like on an apple or a banana. Uh, we have mapped them to various USDA databases. 90% of that mapping we could do automatically. That was a big win. There's 100,000 of these things, right? We did not want to hand map all those. 
But it turns out there's a really interesting correspondence between the way grocery stores organize food and the way USDA groups foods. And we exploited that sort of natural correspondence to do the automatic mapping. And then we had two nutritionists, Chris Helpless with this, and Jennifer North, uh, then a graduate student in then the Division of Nutrition help with the, with the last 10%. And from there, we can do the HEI model. Um, this gives you an idea of how that thing works. Don't they can ignore that. Uh, the food plan model, but we're not limited to these two things. We could do other, other kinds of metrics as well. DASH, uh, which is used to uh, keep an eye on sodium. The Mediterranean diet is something we'd like to focus on. Uh, we know that the new dietary guidelines that are due out this, this year are going to put a strong emphasis on added sugars, so we're taking a look now at how we can get a better fix on added sugars. Uh, so that's our data in a nutshell. So what are the pros of this approach? Well, there's a lot of pros. We operate, we can look at everything in the market basket. How many people here use MyFitnessPal or have used it? How many have used it and stopped using it because it's such, <laughs> such a pain? My wife, my wife uses it. She tries to track her food. It's really tedious, right? Um, and it's likely, to, it, it does get all the food she eats, which is good. But uh, there's a whole bunch of metrics out there. I can show you some others at the end if you're interested. We're one of the very few approaches that tries to look at everything that's in the shopping cart. Uh, we can uh, adapt it. We've already adapted it to two different models. We hope to adapt it to more. And we, we, since we have the historical data, retrospective and prospective, we can measure over any time span, which is handy. It's not a single shot. Uh, and it's painless for patients and other customers. All they have to do is shop, which is something they have to do anyway, right? We don't ask, we don't put any burden at all on the shopper. It's unbiased by recall. Now, th usually at this point, someone says, but I don't do all my shopping at Smith's. I also shop at Whole Foods. Absolutely true. So my goal is to get as many grocery retailers on board as we can. I think it's, it's a bootstrap, right? If we can show we're doing good work with Kroger, and get some kind of partnership going with the health plan, say, or the hospital or um, wellness program, then I think interest will grow and we will be able to recruit more and more retailers. But wherever they shop, I mean, uh, once we get all the retailers, then they can't hide. They cannot hide from us. We will get, we will get their foods. Uh, and it has the advantage of being able to look backwards as well as forwards. And it's cheap because stores collect these things for their own purposes for marketing, for inventory, and it's scalable, we think, because virtually all stores collect these data. So it's just as easy for us to run, and you'll see some examples where we run the HEI model on entire stores. Uh, it's just a matter of you know, a few minutes more compute time. Uh, so it's, so it's, it is truly scalable, but it's not perfect. Uh, we only see grocery data, mentioned that before, but still 60, 70% calories come from retail grocery. It's estimated, so that's a big chunk. We only have the one partner, but it is Kroger. They are the largest grocery chain in the country. Walmart does sell more food, but they sell more of everything. Uh, and unfortunately, they don't have a card. We need that loyalty card at Kroger's to link shopping episodes to the, to the shopping data. So uh, that's uh, another con. Uh, and we know now, you know, we're getting pr pretty good at figuring out what to recommend. You saw that, 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 those, that bar graph with the gaps in it, right? That tells us what, where the gaps are, and we know what these people like to eat, so we think we can make reasonable recommendations, but we just don't yet know how to deliver those. That's an open question where the new science is. Uh, we have been working with Kroger. They have a data analytics company who has the very strange name of 84.51. Can anybody guess where that name? <laughs> You'll never get it. These guys are Kroger Central and this company, they're based in Cincinnati, and that's either the latitude or the longitude of Cincinnati, and, and it's really hard to remember to type, and it's crazy. Uh, we have we've talked with uh, Robin Marcus and Dr. Day about doing something with, you know, beefing up what they're doing with the wellness program quality experiment they're doing with Associated Foods. Uh, we're st we've sort of explored some things with the Utah Health Plans, that, the Utah Health Plans, that's a pretty large insurer in this state, over 100,000 people. They take care of all the Medicaid patients in the state, and that's capitated money, right? So they want to keep those 
pre-diabetics in that class of people from getting to be a diabetic. And so we're trying to see if we can organize a study that would do exactly that by looking at their shopping patterns and nudging them again into a healthier uh, food uh, environment, not unlike the current ongoing diabetes prevention program that's being run by Julie Mitos and Tim Graham. Uh, we have an early stage project in the Utah Pediatrics, the University Pediatrics Clinic. They are really concerned about their kids that are at the 80% or higher BMI level. So Bali has been working with them um, on a number of projects, but our goal is to do a study here where we can share with the provider and the family the quality of um, the household food budget and really then get some engagement because they're really into to motivational interviewing and, and that style of behavior change. We'll be able to give them the data that they, that they lack uh, at the moment. Um, work with Tim Graham and the, with the Diabetes and Ob Obesity and Metabolism Service Line. You may know that we're, a number of us are working together to create a new training grant T32 application on this very topic. Uh, we filed the disclosure with the Tech Venture Office uh, and have an active effort to, ongoing to commercialize what we're doing. Um, and just recently, I'm happy to announce, uh, we got two grants funded from the USDA in collaboration with um, Carrie Durward at, uh, at USU. Just very briefly, the, the one is a small area grant. It's a very tiny amount of money, but, but they're really interested in looking at um, differences between Hispanics and non-Hispanic SNAP participants who are getting a specific kind of um, nutrition education from USDA. And the idea is, well, let's look at before, during, and after these educational classes and see if there's any deflection in the quality of the food. And then we're doing the same thing on a much bigger scale. This is a multi-state study. I want to look at nearly 2,000 people, has a proper control group, um, looking at multiple different food quality variables. And again, it's designed to see to what effect these um, nutrition classes that they're with the mounting cult, FNEP and SNAP-ED, if they're doing any measurable good. Sorry? SNAP are the, um, is the electronic benefit food stamp card program. So the SNAP-ED program is for people who, have the, who are on food stamp SNAP cards. Uh, it's, it's designed to, they, they're not mandatory. People volunteer for these classes. And it teaches them a number of things about how to shop, how to avoid the wrong foods and target the right ones. The other interesting thing about this is the other half of this study, we're going to be validating that thing I showed you before, the ASA 24. It's never been validated in low-income populations. It's a huge gap in its utility because they, they just didn't have the money to, to validate that. So we're using the same company, Weststat, who work with NCI to validate uh, for non-low-income people and um, we have Amy Subar, who's the, the mother of the ASA 24 on the team. So that's going to be very exciting. So when I'll do this cool stuff with Qualmart, we'll be able to expand the utility of the ASA 24. So in a nutshell, right, we, we, once people sign up with the class, then we go back and we grab, if they consent, we grab their retrospective data and then follow them for a year and just see what happens. Um, you know, I, I sh we, as I said, we don't really know how to display this information. For sure, we want to display this to patients, right? Let them see maybe either through an app or the personal health record, you know, some kind of at a glance how they're doing. If we had some kind of rewards program, you could imagine a, game, a gamification version of this where you know, they get rewards or they're, they're playing a game of some kind to, to, to motivate them. And you can think of any number of ways. This is all pie in the sky, right? We're just, we haven't started this work at all. We also want to show this information to clinicians. So we think clinicians, let's face it, nutrition and exercise, these are really important behavioral factors about which there is virtually nothing in the electronic health record. So if you're a diabetic, you have a hemoglobin A1C in that electronic health record, but if you're overweight, you have no insight into the nutritional profile at your household. So we want to make that content, we want to expose that to clinicians. Uh, and they're probably interested in long-term trends, we think. Um, and again, it would make suggestions that would help clinicians and their patients start talking about improving diet. And uh, we probably is going to be in integrated into Epic at some point. That would be our logical target. That's just an example. I just made that one up, just with something. You know, something to show at a glance for patients. Oh, I'm doing pretty well. Oops. I'm doing pretty well, or I'm not doing so well. 
Now I promised I'd say something about the public health side of this. So we see it of use for clinicians, utility for health plans and doctor's offices and whatnot. Uh, but it's also a public health because we can measure at scale. Um, so here's some interesting things that we've, we've done with this data. Here's a map of the Salt Lake Valley, several stores. It's a little it's faded in this slide. looks much better on my screen. But the larger circle is, the more households shop there. And the greener it is, the better their HEI score. We didn't use the entire HEI in this particular study. Uh, along the Wasatch front, pretty good, but then as you head south and west, the scores get less good, right? They get poorer. And the, oops. I don't know if anybody, anybody noticed that little red dot there. What do you think that is? It's a Smith store. I'll give you a clue. There's the Avenue Smith. It is the gas station. You know, again, <laughs> You would not expect the gas station convenience store to be pushing a lot of bananas, avocados, and strawberries <laughs> out the door. So again, it's again, sort of a face validity, but it shows you how this HEI thing can actually work at different scales. Yeah? That actually might show that uh, the 40% that you don't get is in the awful, I mean, the, the much less Right, and so in a real study where we had, we're doing, I mean, everything we've been doing so far has been retrospective data, right? If we actually had enrolled families, then we would have to know things just like that. Um, like, how often do you shop at a farmer's market? Because that's, that's an important. Um, interestingly, I don't think I have that slide. We don't, we thought we might see a big dip in fruits and vegetables for that very reason. Across the whole population of data that we had, we did not see a dip like that. But we didn't look at, like the people at Smith's, again, I, I, I shop at this Mitch Smith's and I shop at the food market downtown and so, so um, farmer's market rather. So uh, it'd be interesting to see if that, that store in particular, if we, if we can see that dip. That's future work. True. But I bet. I tend to think that I need healthier and healthier That's what I would bet, too. Right. Have you ever thought about ways of. The trick is to link a shopping episode to a particular household. We can do it at Kroger because all the Kroger stores have a, have a card. Um, I'm going after Safeway. I am starting a sabbatical at the end of next week. One of my goals is to get Safeway on board because they have one of those cards. The um, people on SNAP, we, for example, I, I think it's a very important population. We could tell that they shopped at a convenience store and how much they spent, but, we, but they don't keep track of what's actually purchased. So you, you, know, you have a sense of how much is spent compared to what they're spending at the grocery store. So maybe there's a model there and you could figure out how to st study that more deeply. But, Going down to the level of expenditure is about the best we're going to do with SNAP. Now, somebody suggested that I try to convince the credit card companies to give me that same data. There's, the, there's this misconception that credit card companies get this tally of UPCs whenever you do a shop, but they don't. Uh, but, but just getting the expenditures, that would be really handy. But somehow, I don't think I can talk <laughs> Visa into doing that. So let's just take another look at this map, and then I'm going to project up a census track level of uh, people at one and a half percent or below poverty. Very similar, like along the Wasatch Front, by and large. So if it's darker, it's poorer. And you can see that it follows out that same kind of curve of bad quality. Um, we're gonna get that data mapped onto this map at some point, but I just did not have time to make that map. It looks so much better on my screen, I apologize. <laughs> A great question, Jason. <laughs> it must be uh, those <laughs> impoverished graduate medical students. Uh, and credit here goes to Tui. For, for, we used to estimate her. And here's some kind of it's, it's kind of fun. It's kind of intercity thing. So we here's just one food component: the uh, the dairy score. 
for Salt Lake City, we, we blew it out a little bit to get stores that went further north and further south. We did pretty good, right? There's a red store there. It, that's not the convenience store because it's too big, right? Because the size of the, the dot is how many households shop there. But it's pretty good. Now you compare that to Seattle. Seattle has a lot more stores. And again, it's a little washed out up here, but um, all these pink and gray stores, there's a few more of them than here. And then Atlanta, at this huge cluster. Now, I don't know anything about the, the, the demography of Atlanta. Maybe someone does, but. Yeah, I'd like to know. So do you know anything about, the, is that where a particular population, this part of the town? Yes, ma'am. No waste there. Again, not, not with the data that, that we have, obviously, but uh, this comes up frequently when I give a talk like this. Well, what about waste? Because that, that, that is important. Um, I think if we had a proper R01 style thing where we could actually go into households and, and figure that kind of stuff, I mean, that would be a messy job. Jason, I would need a graduate student to go in there and open the trash can up and see, see how much that was wasted. But, um, You know, I tried to find a recent study on household waste. Does anybody know of a study? I see some nutrition people here. At, uh, in, in the, I found some really good studies in the UK. Now, Phil Brewster did an interesting study. It's, it's well known in the literature that people who smoke um, have a poor diet. There's a correlation there. So Phil was interested to see if he could find it. So using his food plan-based model, he selected 4,000 households at random from the four regions that, that we uh, were looking at and uh, asked like the simplest possible question. Has that household in 15 months ever purchased a tobacco product or never purchased a tobacco? tobacco product, turns out that that ratio of about 3,000 to about 12,000, 13,000 is about 20%. It's about the number that the CDC estimates smokers around. So that's, that's kind of nice to, to, to know. But what he found was in every category except for total proteins, there was a significant increase of food quality in the households that in these different categories that didn't um, have any tobacco as opposed to those that had tobacco even just one time and there's like a four or five point difference. Easier to see that on a graphic. So this, this is the had ever purchased tobacco shifted to the left in terms of quality, and never purchased tobacco shifted to the right in terms of quality. And it has a nice, fairly normal shape, which is reassuring. And that was the work of Phil Brewster, which he presented at the Experimental Biology Conference earlier this year. So what are we gonna do next? Well, we need to, ref we need to keep improving our models for sure. We need to find new metrics. Um, Metrics that would be of interest to things like clinicians, food plans, wellness programs, those are our targets. Uh, you need to add more groceries for sure. And that means finding ways to efficiently add new UPCs. So we have 100,000 UPCs, but there are over a million UPCs. Wally, do you know how many unique food UPCs there are? In our data set, but, but in, in the whole world. Oh. 
Sure. So as we, we know that we don't have the complete set for sure, right? So as we add new grocers, uh, don't forget the lesson of Greek yogurt. I mean, 10 years ago, there wouldn't have been a UPC, I bet, in most grocery stores for Greek yogurt or energy drinks, but now they're abundant. So um, we know we, that's an infrastructure problem we have to fix, and that's one of Volley's, one of Volley's dissertational aims. And uh, we have to brainstorm with partners like uh, health plans, like wellness programs, like clinicians to find out, okay, if I can show you this data, how would you like to see it? When would you like to see it? I would like to do some brainstorming, something I hope to do during my sabbatical to figure out how best to deliver this information. Uh, and then, um, again, to get back to the, a lot of people, oops, I misspelled <laughs> epidemiologist. A lot of people um, are in the mapping of UPC business, particularly nutritional epidemiologists. So Vali and Tui built a tool which lets you type in a UPC uh, the idea is we, we need to know in this large database of about 8,000 foods that the USDA collects called the FNDDS, uh, what's the closest match to a progresso, this is another naming problem, right? That's progresso low sodium beef vegetable soup. So if you type in the barcode, this comes up. We get this information from another web source and then the tool tries to rank the nearest things already in the data. We can't add things to this database, so the, the goal is to pick the one that's the closest for, to complete that mapping. And so it shows you the contenders with some macronutrients. Volley has come up with a whole array of other things to help the, the mapper. Um, here's an example of one. So here's the Progresso, and here's a breakdown of uh, the total fat, total carb, total protein of the nearest neighbors. And the idea is that maybe with this kind of metric or others that she's come up with, then the mapper could say, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the closest one. We're going to call that, we're going to map that to the code for that guy. So behind the scenes, there's a lot of infrastructure building going on, too. Oops. And that's it. Any other questions? Sir. Right. Whatever. <laughs> whatever pathology it takes to do that all day. Yeah, so then you could get, you know, it's better than a 24 hour recall, better than, you know, their whole household grocery purchases. So did you look into trying to get Well, I would argue it probably isn't necessarily better than a 24 hour recall because it is um, time consuming and you've got to remember, you're being forced to recall the same kind of thing. So With you're the, doing it right then rather than. Oh, I see. It's all like the kind of person who walks around, as soon as they leave McDonald's, they, they Big Mac. Yeah. 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 yeah, I actually saw a poster where they were comparing uh, entries from Trader Joe's uh, and there were like four different products under the same UPC, and it's just that data, that self-contributed data is pretty dirty. But yeah, I think, I mean, sure, I would love to reach out to other two, you know, particularly to gamers, right? I think there's a way that a lot of this could be gamified and make it fun for people, particularly younger people. But there were other questions, I think. Sorry? And these shops are, they, it was all about there's a lawsuit between different ones in, in central Utah. It's become a huge thing in <laughs> Provo and, and <laughs> wow. just what we need. This is why I love to study food, right? Because it's just so wacky. I mean, I used to do natural language, pro I still do it, but it's not something you can talk about at a cocktail party. But food, everybody <laughs> understands food. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>